June 14, 2008. Myself and my good friend, long-suffering Sunderland fan, Ian Holyman, were refreshing ourselves in a bar called Solo Vino, only wine, on Universitat Strasse in Innsbruck. Euro 2008 had just taken wing. Spain had beaten Sweden with a last-minute goal from David Villa to qualify for the knockout rounds of the European Championships. And across a crowded bar, I spotted somebody that I'd seen before and his defensive partner. They were Joachim Bjorklund and Patrick Anderson. Joachim, Jockey Bjorklund, came over and said, I've seen you on Revista de la Liga. He went on to intimate that he didn't mind my patter too much. And the encounter led to a long and very robust drinking session, which we enjoyed. And we've been friends ever since. I'm Graham Hunter. This is the big interview. I think I've given you sufficient clues that today's guest is going to be the marvellous Jockey Bjorklund. He was a former colleague of mine at La Liga Television until he went back to coach, help coach Hammarby in his native Sweden. But Jockey, remember, was a very key part of the Sweden international side that reached the semis in two successive tournaments, Euro 92 in his home nation and then, spectacularly, USA 94. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about those experiences. Jockey's dry, witty, funny, but he's a very good witness to what's been going on in European football since the early 90s. This time, I wanted to get inside Jockey's time at Valencia, where he played with copious legends. Think about that team. Piojo Lopez, Angloma, Carboni, Canizares, the emerging Alberta, Baraja, and the mighty Gaisca Mendieta. Jockey played under both Claudio Ranieri, reaching a cup final, winning it, and Hector Cooper, two extremely interesting coaches. Remember that he marched his team, certainly in the first season, all the way to the Champions League final, and Los Che reached two consecutive Champions Leagues in Paris and Milan, with two heartbreaking results. It was a trophy-winning spell for Jockey at Valencia, and he tells us how it was that he and his teammates held the voodoo sign over Barcelona and had a habit of absolutely battering Louis van Gaal's Catalan team. We'll also find out exactly how much Jockey loves cricket, and you'll learn what his all-time 11 on the cricket field is, because Jockey's special. Enjoy the big interview. Again, you listeners, um, if you're on the video version of this, then you can already see. If you're not, then I'm going to tell you who we're with. We're with somebody who I'm um, privileged to call a friend, and he's got the freedom and he knows it to deny that during the podcast. So this is more than a guest. A guest um, who, when we first met, um, encouraged me to go and tell a Champions League winner that he had a fat arse. That's how good friendships really truly begin. We're with Joachim, Jockey, Jockey Bjorklund. Uh, Jockey, first of all, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, good to be here. Jockey, um, I've saved, uh, we've never done um, a true false round to begin any of the big interviews before. But this is not long answers. This, this is true false. And, and I'd only ask you, no lying, because you've got a devilish sense of humour. So, here we go, Jockey, are you ready? This is true, false. Jockey, you could easily name, as a football in Sweden, your all-time cricketing 11, taking in all major cricket, cricket countries and eras. True or false? Uh, true, for sure. Jockey Brooklyn, even though only 12 and not in possession of Wellington boots or a Macintosh, you were sitting in the pouring rain of the European Cup Winners' Cup final in 1983 in the Ullevi Stadium in Gothenburg, cheering on the mighty dandies. True or false? True, with my granddad. Jockey, 
Your father played for your uncle at Usters and very nearly knocked out the European champions in season 1979-80. Mm, I wouldn't call it very nearly, but uh, he played him. He played him. We're taking it. Jockey Bjorkland, you played international football for your country at the Camp Nou. No, that's false. International football. For my country? For, uh, no, 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 I did. I did. Yes. Olympics. It's true. Ah, but for one jockey nil. <laughs> and Jockey Bjorkland, like Wes Brown of Manchester United, secrets galore now, you are partial to a little bit of snus. Uh, that's probably true, yeah. But I'm a Swede, I got an excuse. Jockey Bjorkland, you twice helped your club reach the Champions League final. Mm, yeah, partly true. Didn't participate much in the last season, no, but yeah, sure. I'll take that, it sounds good. I'll take that. Mr. Jockey Bjorkland, you were within one win of reaching the World Cup final and within two wins of an Olympic gold medal. Uh, true on the first one, for sure. And I'd say three wins, Olympic gold medal, right? Because we lost in the quarterfinals. That was the one. Yeah, yeah. That was the only false one. Yeah, that's the false one. Really good. Yeah. Really good afternoon. Last two, you currently coach a team where a splendid young Iraqi midfielder is named after an Argentinian teammate of yours. That's true. Though he's Swedish. True. Last one, and I've already hinted at this. You once told me to tell Patrick Anderson that he, <laughs> that he had a fat arse, and Patrick was deeply unimpressed. True, but I mean, in the end, we measured. He had the biggest sauce in the Swedish national team. We did a few measurements, and it's true. <laughs> who, who, did, who did the measurement? You weren't out there on a tape measure. No, no, I wasn't. Right? He's a friend of mine. <laughs> you understand? All right, let, let, let's, let's go all the way back, because you are genuinely, and, and thanks for the fun, you are part of a dynasty. Like you said, your granddad was the president of Gothenburg, your uncle was a talented coach who coached the national team. Your dad was a talented footballer and eventually a, a talented coach. Um, and now we already know that your boys play football and Callis playing for you at Hammerby. L let's go back to Osters and explain what I mentioned about your dad playing against the European champions because that must have been a gigantic occasion. Nottingham Forest had beaten a Swedish team to win the European Cup and in the first round of the next season, they yeah. got to town. Uh, in retrospect, uh, obviously a shame to get the reigning champions in the first round, but uh, Uster, my local team, where my the, the granddad was the president for uh, 46 or 48 years, uh, won the league uh, and got drawn against Nottingham, Nottingham Forest, with Peter Shilton, Viv Anderson, Larry Lloyd, etc. Uh, and that's actually my first trip abroad. Uh, it's 80, I think. And the whole family went to England to watch the game, to Nottingham, to City Ground. Uh, so I remember the, the game pretty well. And you say it was close, but I think in, in the two games, it wasn't even that close. But there you go. Good experience. L literally, what was the atmosphere like? Because if I'm not wrong, I think... Just a Tony Woodcock goal in one of the matches makes a difference. And you pointed out that, you know, it was full of elite footballers. John Robertson, like I mentioned, Woodcock, John McGovern from, you know, an Aberdonian life. Uh, we're getting Scottish, right? Uh, listen, baby, there's going to be so much of this. You have no idea how much you're going to get of this. We're going to talk about Ilya Kiryakov in the World Cup. Man, it's just going to come at you. Also, the World Cup, the Olympic medal was denied to you by Australia. You didn't know that he, they were coached by Aberdeen centre half, Eddie Thompson. So don't open Pandora's. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. All the way. <laughs> and by the way, I enjoyed my, my years in Scotland as well, so no worries. But seriously, what, what does it do to a relatively small town when they draw the champions? And, and what, was the, what was it like for your father at that stage? Because he was one of the team's stars. And your uncle was coach, right? Probably a good thing for him, but uh, then again, uh, in those days, for uh, younger watchers or listeners, uh, 
it wasn't like Champions League. You had one head-to-head meeting uh, and then you were either in or out. And, and to get drawn against the champions in the first game, it's a little bit of an unlucky, I'd say. And the year after, they go, got by Munich in the first round as well, which wasn't much uh, better. But, you know, great experience uh, playing it against uh, some of the best players in the world, reigning champions, uh, and I'm sure he enjoyed it. But he would have enjoyed more to get a couple of easy draws and uh, advance, I think, to be honest. And, you, and, and history's repeating itself at the moment because your boy Kala is a centre-half for Hammerby, but you, if I'm not wrong, you end up playing for your dad quite early in your career, right, as coach? Yeah, I even played with my dad as a player when he, when he played. Uh, my last season was his... My first season was his last season in now we're talking Öster again and we played together for five or six games in, in the top division of Sweden and uh, then a few years later I'm, I had him as a coach and uh, for me it, it was a good experience it was a good experience I was there before him he came after me so it wasn't like uh, any talk about nepotism or what have you and I enjoyed it he, he was a good coach and uh, he still is, and most of everything is still is still my dad. And now I'm in the same situation, which, to be honest, from a coach's point of view, is a bit tricky at the time, because uh, you have to divide it. You're either a father or you're a coach, and uh, you can't have it both. So we've decided that privately, I'm his dad, and at work, I'm his coach, and that's the way it works. And it gets a little bit harder for him to get in the team, but that's that's part of it, isn't it? Did you and your dad speak about it? Because when he coached you, I think it's at Brann, right? In yeah, Bergen. yeah, right. And, and, and but so you know, the modern way is to talk and to share. But maybe some years ago, football wasn't quite so keen on that. So how did you and Carl Kalle, your dad? after whom your son's named. How did you work that one out? Nah, he just told me to play better, and that was it. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said yes, coach, or yes, dad, depending on the environment. Uh, no, it was different at that time, but uh, fortunately enough, I had uh, a season before in the, in the first team, top tier in Norwegian football, and uh, not to be boasting, but uh, I think I was the best player the year before he came, so... It wasn't really a problem, to be honest. I imagine that because you're really explosive here, uh, and, and it's an ex- this is the first of the places that I, I want to stop, and I, I'd like you to put yourself back in that mindset, because you've done so well, uh, both at Oster's and at Brand, that when, after the 90 World Cup, um, two players, uh, his Glenn Hussain stops, who, who largely is at, you're slightly different footballers, but you're in the same position, and one other, I think a, a Larson, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Peter Larson. Peter Larson stops. So there are gaps, and, and your form is so good that you're going you're gonna to push your way through. But the end word is nepotism. And I, I, I didn't see it because I've seen you playing subsequently, so I know why you were picked. But it felt like you have maybe had to address that because as you make the breakthrough in the national team, Tommy is your uncle. And it's clear that he picks you on quality and performance but what, have you had to bite back or fight back against that being asked of you in the past? Not really. Uh, obviously, a few headlines first time he picked me. But uh, then again, we're talking about football and uh, everything uh, falls to place, I'd say. I mean, either you're good enough and then you play or uh, you're not good enough and you're not going to play. It's not like if you have a big company where you have a thousand employees... Uh, maybe you can hide away like uh, a son or a wife or a cousin or whatever. But in football, you you sort of, you, you get a receipt every week on the field uh, if you're performing or not. And if I wouldn't have, I would have been out of the team and that's it. So I didn't think much of it, uh, to be honest. Uh, I had a uh, hard enough time to focus about the, the teams who are going to play in, in the Euros, 92. But, but you say that, but it wasn't just the Euros, because I, my memory might be playing with me, but I think I remember you 
being so kind to us in 92, knocking Scotland out of the under 21 championships. So my memory is, plus some research, is that this, this explosive young kid who's been playing football outside Sweden gets brought in in a year where you play the under 21 championships and although you end up injured, Sweden reached the final against Italy, against Cesare Maldini's Italy, Italy, Paolo's dad, another dynasty. You, you then, and we'll stop off at these, you then play the Euros at home where Sweden are hosts. You beat Denmark, you beat England, which is a massive result for a country that's kind of obsessed over your childhood years of watching the first division of Premier League. You play four friendlies and you play the Olympics where you come within, as you said, three matches of a gold medal. 92, you know, as much as you, 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 you're quite a, a laid-back, down-playing guy, 92 is an astonishing year for you. Oh, good year. My oldest son's born 92 as well. So bring that into the mix. Uh, in retrospect, it's a good year. It's a good year and went uh, really fast, really fast. Uh, I've gone through the ranks. I played in the under-17s, under-19s, under-21s. We have you for Sweden, but uh, the call up for for the full international team was a little bit of a surprise. But as you said, I was lucky enough to be in a position where two really good players quit after after World Cup '90. Uh, if they would have stayed on and they could have for another four or five years, maybe another one would have gotten an opportunity. But then again, if you given the opportunity. You have to take it, and uh, I suppose uh, I suppose I did. Though I started playing a left back for Sweden, not like Roberto Carlos, but similar. Do you remember much about um, because with the Aberdeen theme, I could name you know Scott Booth and Ian Jess and Stephen Wright and Michael Watt and goals, uh, and you sneak past us by a single goal. Thanks. But the, the Dutch, now, a bit more serious, the Dutch team that you play against has De Boers and Offermars and a number of players who go on to do big things for their clubs and international team, but less so maybe than the De Boers and Offermars. It's a very good side that you play against and you, you knock out you knock out Holland in the first chunk of that 92 footballing experience. Can you remember that experience? Can yeah, remember? I do. I do. I remember well. Uh, you forgot about the best Scottish players, though. Duncan Ferguson. Big Duncan was yeah, up against Yeah, Big yeah, Duncan yeah. Yeah, was in that team as well. Yeah. No, but I, he, I remember... He went off injured. He's the one who injured me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good percentage bet. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't hold it against him. Uh, no, but it was... Uh, and up to that stage, the Holland game, as you spoke about, which was the final qualifier for the Olympics was probably the best, uh, the biggest game I played in my life up, up until then. We lost 2-1 away and by, I don't know, luck, grit, determination, what have you, a little bit of skill as well. We beat them 1-0 at home and then we qualified for the Olympics and uh, then we played Scotland in the semi-finals. In yeah. Örebro, like a small yeah. town in the middle of nowhere in Sweden. We played Scotland. I got injured in the first game. Could have, could have played in Scotland, but I was injured. But then when the final was, uh, we played Italy. Uh, we had our supposedly three best players away. Me, Patrick and uh, Thomas Brolin were with a full international team preparing for the, for the Euros. And I think... And I believe, still, if we would have been in a team, we would have beaten Italy as well. We would have been under-21 uh, European champion. Uh, under-21 level, were you still playing centrally? or? No, no, centrally, down? centrally. Centrally, I only had like uh, three games in my life as a, as a left fullback, and I was my three first Euro 92 England, games. England, Denmark and yeah, France. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the only ones, and please never again. Uh, <laughs> we played the, 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 the striker in Holland at the time was Eric Myers. Decent career, but not, not one of the not one of the famous famous Dutch players. But as you said, uh, the Boer brothers, uh, Overmars, Reggie Blinke, who played 
somewhere in Scotland, I think. Yeah, I've heard of the wrong side of town though. <laughs> No, they, they had a good team. They had a good team. Uh, Newman, Newman played. He played in the right, uh, right side of town as well. Yeah, he was in that team as well. Yeah. We're going to come up against your next uh, adventure against Arthur, to Arthur Newman in just a minute, eh? because these are big results. Um, who was quicker, you or Offermars? Even though you weren't directly... Uh, you, were, you were athletically very, very quick. Were you as quick as Offermars? If we're talking about raw speed, yeah, for sure. Don't bring skills and uh, that into the mix. That, that, that's a whole different story, right? Yes, I've met one player in my whole life, as I can remember, who matched me or probably even beat me at raw speed. And that was uh, Tony Daly, Euro 92, we're talking about again. He was quick. Aston Villa, yeah, playing for yeah, England. Yeah. And you're directly against him, right? Yeah, I was directly against him. And uh, good, the good thing about him, and he he might be the only player I played against who was quicker than me, but he had uh, more or less the same skill set as me as well. So it worked out <laughs> fine in the end. <laughs> I got bad news for you. Tony's a regular listener to the podcast. So good. No, no. If, if there you go. You don't want to adapt that. Okay. In my world, that's a big compliment. You get taken away from an under-21 side, which, if you look at the results, because the, the final against a good Italy side, uh, which will go on and retain their under-21 crown in Spain in the next tournament, um, playing against Spain in the final, it's a couple of years later, but it's against the Raul and De La Peña and Oscar Garcia and so on and so forth. When you get taken away from that side to prepare, obviously the thrill is big, but what was the country like? When, you ho when a country like Sweden hosts a tournament like Euro 92. What was the buzz, the pressure? Did people take it calmly? Because you'll you remember, for example, the only 10 European championships have been in the British Isles of Euro 96. It was in England and, and everybody went absolutely crazy. It was the summer of love, great music. England made it to the semi-finals of Sweden did it. Well, what was the feeling like? What was the buzz like? Did, did Sweden take it really like a fiesta? Yeah, they did. And uh, it was the first time we, we were in the proper Euros as well. Because uh, you remember, because uh, you're more or less my age, right? Uh, how it used to be. How it used to be. It, it wasn't like 24 teams back then, like it is now. It, it was eight teams competing in two groups and to qualify. For the Euros, were, for a small country like Sweden, nearly impossible. And, and we didn't. We got in as a host, which is very unlikely to happen again uh, due to stadiums we have here in Sweden. Uh, but it was the first time Sweden played in the Euros, uh, in the proper Euros. And it was a buzz. We had a new team coming into the tournament. Uh, underdogs for sure. We had England and France in our group and Denmark who got in there in the last second uh, but it was a bust but as I said before I I had uh, enough on concentrating on, on on my own performance to be honest to more than enjoying like the bus around Who was your direct opponent for France? Papa Jean-Pierre Yeah Not bad Decent player Not bad Yeah And if he wasn't and if he wasn't there Cantona rolled out on that uh, on that side, so yeah, two half decent players, I'd say. Uh, but when when you think about that exact match, I think ends in a draw. It, it, it's probably if you had to win two games. Am I, did I exaggerate the de degree to which growing up the Nordic countries were obsessed with England? And and, and there was a little bit. Of, I can't remember exactly why, but there was a little bit of bad blood also. Um, that built up over the years between Sweden and England. I particularly remember immediately after World Cup 98, it was an outright battle um, in the National st t um, Stadium in Stockholm. But, but your win, I'm absolutely sure, must have felt like maybe when Scotland beat England because th there was this obsession with growing up watching BBC, First Division football, Swedes all over your country support Liverpool or United or Leeds or Arsenal, I don't care who it is. That must have felt like a, like a, a mini-final for you. Yeah, it was, and uh, especially due to the circumstances, it was the last game in the group stages. Uh, we knew if we win the game, we were in the semi-finals and England are out. And 
that that brings another level to it as well. But you know, uh, and I think it's the history between England and Sweden as well. At that time, I don't think, uh, and that, that kept on for quite a long time. I don't think England beat Sweden in forty odd years for some reason. We could lose against everybody else, but against England, I think I played them five times, never lost. And I kept on for a while as well. And, and, and it, was, it was a big thing, playing England, everybody. The only international football we can watch in Sweden when I was young was the English, uh, well, not Premier League, but the first of it, uh, whatever you call it, the highest tier of English football. That's the only thing we could watch, and maybe a couple of European Cup finals. So it was a big thing to win against England. I must say, though, England 92, that's not the best side they ever put out. No disrespect to anyone. No, the, the purpose of this conversation is to be um, honest. I'm never abusive, but honest. And it, it was a difficult time for me. I, I mean, I haven't done this research, but my memory tells me that that was... Taylor took Lineker off, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, in his last game, last competitive game for England, yeah. Is, is that as a, as a defender? I'm okay, at that stage, you're still left back, because I don't think you moved to centre half until the Germany game, I think. But you see Lineker going off, do you kind of go, take a box and go, okay, that definitely is one less threat? It is, it is. They brought on uh, Alan Smith, a very good player as well, who played uh, at Arsenal at the time, but. Uh, Any time they take out England's top scorer ever, as he was at the time, it, it's it's a relief, isn't it? And uh, looking back at it, it's nice to have played Gary Lineker the last time he played against uh, he played for England and won. Did, this, did help us a little bit because I, I, I'm not quite sure why Thomas Brolin has become a creature of mythology because there are many footballers who've been a little bit eccentric, who've gained a little bit of weight, uh, who've got talent, and that, that describes some of the parts of him. But for some reason, everybody over about five, six years around Europe went crazy about him. He was like, this is the only guy who's ever behaved like this. Describe him, tell us about him. Oh, but as a Swede, it's, uh, it's easy, because we, uh, we had great success in the Euros, as we talked about, 92 went to semi-finals. And then uh, two years after, uh, same again in the World Cup, went to the same semi-finals. And in those two tournaments, he was by far, I'd say, our best player. So that's that's his status in Swedish football. And then he quit after a pretty serious injury at 28. So nearly. He could have been a rock star if he would have died at 27. But it's... Uh, it's close to, isn't it? Close by. I, I like the Jimi Hendrix, Mama Cass Elliot, Janis Joplin reference, but I think people thought he was, I think he thought he was a rock star, and that's what I'm fishing for. Have we got him wrong? What was he like as a guy? Really good guy. Still a really good friend of mine, which I see a lot more of now uh, than I'm in Sweden after 25 years than I have uh, before. Good guy, humble guy, and... For Sweden, for a few years, probably our best play in modern time, except for, except for the big one. I, I look, I'm glad to hear that because his skill and, his, and everybody, you know, it doesn't matter much to me, but I know people love flair in the goal celebration. So that little pirouette that he did, particularly when he was doing it for your country and for Parma, he, he really was the hot ticket. And also I think he was a guy who, even at his most even as at the elite level of football, was slightly differently shaped because he was small and he was like slightly built like a barrel, yet his explosive movement in space and his ability to do things that you, you didn't expect marked him out as special, I think. Yeah, it did. It, it did. And uh, I mean, even in, in back in those times, he, he, how should I put it in a nice way, didn't look like an elite sportsman. Yeah. Is that a good way to put it? But uh, for Sweden, every time he played, he played fantastic. It was a short career. It, it, by the way, it was the best play in, uh, in the World Cup 90 for Sweden as well when he, when he broke through. So he's played 
three tournaments for Sweden and being the best player in each of the tournaments. So that, that, that's why his uh, big status in Sweden, I think. When you go away for four or five weeks to the States, to what everybody now likes to call the OJ Simpson World Cup, I was there as a fan with my wife and my brother just nicking about on like an interrail. Uh, you could get now with trains, you could get them with planes. You paid $300 and you had a month's free air travel if you went standby, which now, of course, you know, with security concerns, everybody thinks, everybody thinks I've made it up, but I haven't. Um, again, before the matches, and before the fact that you, you have Sweden's second greatest performance in the World Cup ever, um, what, what, was the, what, was, what was this experience of going together as a group to the States like, above and beyond the matches? Uh, being in the States, I mean, you've been obviously for a long time. It's it's a fantastic place to visit. And we, or at least I, hadn't been there a lot before. We went on a pre-season, like a pre-World Cup tour to to Miami. And then we, play, we played two games in Miami, like uh, in January that year, January, February. And then a game in Mexico. And that, that was my whole experience of the of the States and our generation, we all grown up with American culture, aren't we? And uh, then we get drawn in the group who's going to play the first game in the, in LA, which was pretty nice. We had a couple of weeks in San Diego before the World Cup started. Uh, and amazing experience. And then we got to travel a bit. We played a game in Los Angeles to Detroit, which at the time it uh, wasn't very nice. Everybody said, downtown Detroit, prohibited. Don't go in there, right? I had my wife uh, just across the border in Windsor in Canada. So I had to go through. Or had to. I did a couple of times. But uh, it was like a war zone back then. And then we played a game in Dallas in 45 degrees heat at 12 noon. San Francisco and then back to LA for another couple of games. Fantastic experience, big crowds uh, who knew nothing about football, to be honest, but I think we averaged on our seven games in the World Cup close to 80,000 per game. But back then they didn't have a clue about uh, football or soccer or whatever, whatever they want to call it. But stadiums were great. Uh, Crowds were big, and the life in the States as a 23-year-old was was good. Good experience. And then, footballing-wise, it's pretty decent as well. What did they allow you to do? Because I, I, I've been lucky enough to be TV producer with Spain on three tournament wins. And I've noticed that, certainly for uh, Luis Aragonés and Del Bosque, there was a really good mix of double training sessions, which weren't about fitness, they were about ball work, about the players were desperate to get on the ball, so there was a second session, there was some tactics, there was lots of mini matches, fine, all that. But both of them allowed a little bit of social time, proper social time, which as journalists for clubs now, we're used to not really getting near and, and superstars and nightclubs and, and private jets and all that shit. But with Spain, it wasn't. They, they, they just went out, and, and under Dabowski, they were, he told them, you beat Portugal, you're going out big, lads. My only rule is, make the plane the next day back to the base camp. That's it. Uh, what were the rules for you there? We had uh, pretty similar rules. I mean, if you're uh, competing with your national team, you're going to behave more or less right uh, anyway. You're not going to do anything that damages your opportunity to win the next game. But we had pretty lax rules. We had a big uh, responsibility on the players to take care of themselves. And in between the training sessions, we I don't think we trained twice once over the World Cup because... You're there to compete. You need to be fresh for the games. We had pretty lax rules. We went out and about and uh, had a look over uh, every town. And I'm not saying every bar because we didn't. But, you know, to grab a beer every now and again together, I think uh, in those days, that's the way it was. And it's about if you stay together for six weeks, you can't be locked in with the team for six weeks. Then it's impossible to inform, to perform. He left a lot of responsibility to the players. And I think we responded to it. We had a good time. We had a really good time. 
in training, not in matches, what, what were you beginning to think about that, this little dreadlock kid who played for Feyenoord? Because I guess you kind of had a massive exposure to Henke Larsson uh, prior to that, and certainly this would be regarded as his breakthrough tournament. In private, in training, what were you beginning to think of him? I played him a few times in, in the Swedish league before we went there, and uh, he's the same age as me, but he broke through a little bit later than I in the national team, in general, I think, but uh, then he lasted a lot longer than me as well. Uh, really good player who had a hard time uh, getting a starting place because we had two good players up front. We had uh, Martin Dallin and uh, Kenneth Anderson. Kenneth scored five goals and Martin four. Uh, hard to get in that team, but obviously you could see, you could see already that he was going to be a good player. Then again, he played for a dark side. But like, he was made to play in midfield at Fyre, which is one of the reasons he, he, he left. And, and I, I wondered if, if you were seeing identical movement from him in training sessions, because I think he, I don't think it's talked about a lot, but I think he was an immensely bright footballer who figured out a lot about the game and chose, when I saw him, chose a, a, a completely different attitude how to play and behave at Celtic compared to Feyenoord. Then when he went to Barcelona, he had to relearn football. And I've watched him relearn it when, when Eto or Xavi wouldn't give him the balls when he was making a Celtic run. And he was used to saying, I've made that run, give it. And Celtic did because he just scored and won them things. And I believe that probably you were saying a Henrik Larsson in 94, and when you played him previously, who was quite different from the Henrik Larsson in, in the latter two thirds of his career. Yeah, for sure. For sure, I think his uh, biggest uh, strength as a footballer was that he developed uh, into a thinking footballer. A thinking footballer who could adapt to, to his environment, to adapt uh, against whoever he was playing, to the opponent. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't the quickest, he wasn't the most skillful, he didn't have the hardest shot, but he, he was one of the most clever footballers I've seen, at least from Sweden. Uh, uh, he was really good at that and he kept evolving the older he got as well. And that's that's why, if you look at it now, his best years were probably his last years in football. Because uh, he developed all the time. Really good player, but back then he was more as an out-and-out striker, I'd say. Out-and-out striker who wanted to get the the ball deep in front of goals and score. But they developed into a really, really good footballer. Again, I'm going to laugh at myself here because, um, and it's funny because when we're on television together, you laugh at me because I'm a romantic and the words are here, they are. And, and I know you're playing ball with me at the moment. You're giving a little bit more than you would normally do, which I respect. But I'm still going to ask the same question, which, make, which makes me happy. What kind of emotional experience was the Romania game? Because the World Cup is in the States, it's a 12.30 kickoff. It's extra time and penalties. You're winning, then you're not, then you're losing. I, I know you were desperate to take a penalty, absolutely. I bet you were absolutely disgusted that you were taken off just before the end. And eventually, you know, tell a story from the Jockey Bjorklin point of view. Because that game, if you look at it, that's the kind of game that the World Cup... That's why the World Cup is, is loved and cherished and lost it after. Yeah, to talk in uh, cliches, it's, it's a roller coaster, isn't it? We beat Saudi Arabia like a few days before in, uh, in even bigger heat Dallas. Yeah, in Dallas, uh, which is a nice draw to get in, in the last 16th, isn't it? Uh, Saudi Arabia. And then by a miracle, we get Romania instead of Argentina, which was, well, obviously we watched the game. I think that's one of the best games in, in the World Cup 94, when Romania beat uh, Argentina. We get Romania, we know we're on the roll, we know we, uh, we have a big chance of winning a game. Get, uh, get ahead, 1-0, great free kick. Best free kick, uh, I wasn't involved, but I was on the pitch. 
obviously I wasn't involved. I was staying back at the halfway line, right? <laughs> but I was on the pitch at least. Great free kick, score 1-0. I think I got subbed because I had a problem with my groins in like the 80th minute or whatever. Another 10 minutes to keep them away from a goal. They score, start the extra time. Stefan Schwartz gets sent off. They score 2-1 and you think it's over. You think it's over and uh, you're disappointed. But you've been away for five weeks, so you see like you see a little bit of a silver lining. Or at least I'm gonna go back to my to my family at home. I see my family again, which I haven't seen for for a while, right? Because you want to put a positive spin on it. And then uh, Kenneth equalizes on a great header, fantastic header, and he gets the penalties. And uh, when the penalty started, I, I was. Pretty comfortable being subbed out, I must say. <laughs> Though I would, I would have been tenth or eleventh, tenth or eleventh, I think, to take a penalty, <laughs> and it, it didn't go that deep, it didn't go that far. But how much, how much faith? Because if I'm not wrong, the keeper who's out there for Sweden that day is your teammate, or yeah, he's, he's, you're already at Gothenburg. It's it's Ravelli. So you know him, you, you, you may be in training even for fun, you've taken penalties against him, certainly you'll have watched him in training. Well, what, what, were your, what was your thought process as Romania come up against him? Because he does well. Before it started, I, I thought we were going to win. Because he, he, he was a really good goal, goalkeeper, he's most famous for his crazy antics in the World Cup 94. But he was a great goalkeeper. I, I watched him growing up because he played with my dad as well for quite a few years before I played with him. Uh, really good goalkeeper, good on penalties. I thought before it started, we're going to win this. And then we go and miss the first penalty. Uh, Håkan Mild missed the first penalty. And then, you know, it's uphill from there. But you know how it is. It's, uh, it's a roller coaster. Uh, one, one second, you think. Then he saves one and it goes into extra penalties. We score the first one. You're in with the chance, they score again, etc. It was a nice ending to it, though, I must say. Well done to the eccentric. What was the eccentricity of, of Ravelli? What, was, was that just because the goalkeepers... Because whenever you hear him interviewed, he's a kind of straight, kind of serious guy. And he kind of looks like a bank manager or an accountant. No, no, plain and simple, he's a crazy guy. That's what it is. The appearance outside the pitch... He's a knowledgeable, uh, good guy in all, in all the senses of the word, but he's a crazy guy. On the pitch, he's always been a crazy guy, uh, a clown, what have you. He's been eccentric from when he started. Uh, at the games, you couldn't, you, you couldn't speak with him. In the games, you couldn't speak with him. He's unreachable. Unreachable. He's never made a mistake in his life. <laughs> He's one of those. He's one of those guys. But that's probably a good thing yeah, when it comes to penalty shootout. He got a little bit of vindication as well in the World Cup 94. He played for Sweden for, I don't know, 15 years probably before. Since at least, yeah, uh, I think he made his debut like 80 or something. I played with him in Gothenburg. He had a rough season up until the World Cup started. A shaky performance. Uh, First couple of games, and then it all clicked. He's still touring Sweden, doing speeches about seven, saving penalties in '94. <laughs> He's made the most of it. What could you hear behind you? Was he shouting? All the time, all the time, shouting all the time. But I'd say everybody's played with him more than ten games. They've ignored him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the first couple of games you listen and then, you know, it's only bullshit coming out. You, you, you push the ignore button and that's it, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. You make him, it's, it's Thomas, Thomas sounds like a future big interview guest. And, and this is where things are unfair. I mean, you're, you're not a guy who complains an awful lot, but you come out of that test, the 120 minutes, the heat, and, and you're asked to how many days? Three days later? Three, three days. I mean, you're a coach now. What do medics say about the, the recuperation time for athletes to, you know, three days is, is, your, is your bare minimum, right? 
three days is uh, it's the minimum, but it's all right if the other team has uh, three days as well. But they had five days. They had five days, we had three days, uh, and I still don't understand why we played a team that we already met in the group stages in the semifinals. That should have been a final. Saying that, looking back on the semi-final, I wouldn't play it again. We lost 1-0 and that's a very, very flattering result for us. It could have been 5 or 6. It could have been 5 or 6. They, they were the better team. We can talk about preparation all of that. They would have beaten us uh, 9 times out of 10 anyway. But they had a slight advantage in, in the preparation. Yes. Okay. A clue for people listening in, um, before we go to our sponsor's question, you're up against Romario that day, he makes the difference in a team that was, they they were, if you look at their 11, irrespective of the final and how it was pretty boring, their 11, their 15, their 16 is exceptional. So your point's well made. But we're going to come to your revenge over Romario, which happens. But how, how jockey from the inside how do you snap on again with the tiredness, with the dehydration and win a third, fourth place playoff where some guys, I don't know any of your colleagues apart from once having insulted Patrick, some guys might have been thinking out loud exactly what you said, it's time to go home. And you go out there and you, you smack Bulgaria around. How? First and foremost, it would have been a, a shame to finish a, a good tournament with uh, two losses. So the motivation was definitely there. And for for a small country like Sweden to motivate yourself for a third place game, I think it's probably a lot easier than, than if it's France, England, Italy, Germany, what have you. Uh, that's a given. That's a given because we're a small country. It's our opportunity. And then the rumor said it uh, that the Bulgarians had a pretty big party after the semif- uh, semifinal against Italy as well. So that probably helped. Did you get a medal for third? What did you get for third? We got a medal, bronze medal. I think, I think the Bulgarians got the same medal though, so it wouldn't have made a difference. It looked the same at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, we had a medal ceremony after the game, and I'm pretty sure their medal looked the same as us. But I mean, in the end, in the books, we came third. They came fourth, uh, and I don't have a clue where the medal is anyway. So. We, we've got sponsors who keep us alive. Thank you, Bet365. Um, this is a, a basic question, but it's interesting. Because throughout your career, you've played alongside footballers like Brian Lydrop, uh, Gaza Henrik, Jonas Turn, uh, Luis Miller for a while, but also Mendieta, Anglema. We could go on listening because you've been good enough to play alongside special footballers. If I, if, I did, if I avoided the word best and said to you, who's the greatest player that you had the privilege of playing with? Who would you name? That's a tough one. You mentioned some really good names. Uh, some really good names. These are these questions you have to ask in, uh, in advance before we start uh, the bloody podcast, right? So you get a few, few minutes to prepare. I'd say for me it's... Uh, I'd say the best. I wouldn't say the greatest. The best footballers outright are either Brian Ladrup or Paul Gascoigne. As footballers, for sure. Uh, Mendieta, close to it, probably in the end achieved as much as these other guys. But I think as outright footballers, Skillfully, perception, all of that, that that's the two best uh, footballers I've played with. D- drawn out on, on ability to beat a man, special technique, or, or just the thing that makes your heart go jump when they, when they pull off a trick or a skill. What are the things that guided you towards them? They were good at everything, I'd say. Brian, obviously, had a very offensive position, playing for Rangers. He could do a little bit uh, whatever he wanted to, uh, but he did. He did, every game. Every game, scored a lot of goals, a lot of assists, beat his guy every time he wanted to. Uh, I'm not sure it was the right competition for him to play in. I I think he should have been somewhere else, because he... uh, 
he could have played anywhere else in the world and be a world beater for sure. And I think playing in Rangers in Scotland was probably a little bit too easy for him. Gaza, a little bit the same, but then you get the other side as well, the tackling, the ball winning, distribution. Uh, I think the first year I played with Gaza, it's it's hard to beat. He scored 20 odd goals and must have had 20, 30 assists as well. Performed every game, uh, even though he had the lifestyle he had. Well, I was going to say, it wouldn't Paul have been a much greater figure in football if he hadn't been so dull? Yeah, probably, probably, probably. Uh, that, 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 that's, that, that's the word you, that's the word you uh, recognize with uh, Gaza. How does he measure on the Ravelli scale? In a different sense, as crazy, crazy as a bat as well, uh, as Ravelli, but, but in another sense. Gaza is probably the, the kindest player I ever played with. Uh, biggest heart, uh, wanted everybody to feel good, and I think that's, uh, that's a little bit what became his downfall as well. Uh, he wanted everybody else to be happy around him and uh, should have taken better care of himself. But uh, entertainer on and off the pitch, uh, but a generally good guy. And that's, uh, that's what those two things, when people talk about Gaza nowadays, are easily forgotten. I mean, some people, you, you were my age, we remember the good footballer, for sure, the great footballer. Uh, a few people got close to him enough to know he's a really, really good lad. But most people remember the antics, the, the clown. And it's a shame. It's a shame because, as I said, probably one of the best players I ever played with. Fantastic player. I love the fact that um you can claim that you played twice against Romario in the Champions League and he never scored against you. And you won home and away against PSV Eindhoven. That's the first Champions League you ever played, isn't it? We got drawn into a group with the PSV, Milan and AC Milan and uh, Porto. Uh, had a couple of great wins against PSV, who at the time were a really good side with uh, Romario playing up front. Beat them home and away. Just a year, around maybe a year before, a year after the World Cup. But the thing that I, I like is that Romario was such a, you know, he had a similar shape to Brolin, um, maybe a little smaller, but his, his, his ability to spin and turn and do crazy things should have kept a pretty young defender like you on, on your toes. But in each case, you win an Eindhoven as well, which is... The, Tell me your experience of when he was on you or when you're shepherding him to another, just what are the tricks to try and apart from catching him on a bad day, what are the tricks to try and keep Romario quiet? No, I'm pretty sure he kept me on my toes uh, for, for two times 90 minutes uh, anyway. But he was one of those players where I think if you played him, you had to concentrate. You had to concentrate for 90 minutes. And that was the key to try to prevent him uh, from scoring because uh, he was one of those guys uh, not really participating in the game, not uh, in open play and all of that, but all of a sudden you switched off and then he scored. He switched off again and then he scored again, which he did for Brazil. Uh, if we want to mention Romario, we can mention the two goals he scored in the World Cup uh, against us uh, in night four as well. But I think the most important thing, staying switched on. Switched on for, for 90 minutes, otherwise uh, you, you wouldn't have uh, had a chance against Romario. Really, really good. I wouldn't say footballer, but a really, really good goal scorer. One of the, probably the best goal scorer I've played against. Just expand on that, why you would make the difference between a good footballer and a good goal scorer. As refers to Romario? Not to confuse anything about Romario, is obviously a good footballer as well. I'm not meaning that, but yeah. he was a good footballer and an astonishing goal scorer. Yeah, that's the difference. In open play, you got the feel I got him under control. He didn't touch the ball as much as other, other strikers you play against, but then every time the ball went into the box, if you weren't switched off on, it will get there before you. 
and he'll toe poke it in. That's his uh, signature finish as well. Quick, quick toe poke. Uh, you're on your back foot, uh, and it's a goal. Uh, really good, really, really good goal scorer. One of the best uh, in the nineties in in the world, I'd say. Out and out goal scorers. I probably never played against anyone better. It's good. It's a good description. I understand the difference now. I do. Um, <clears throat> Again, you, you put the valuation because the, the, the following season, your, your group is harder in the Champions League. In fact, your group's astonishing. In, in reality, however well Gothenburg has grown, however good a squad you've got, however athletic you are, really, with, with the group you're given, probably, you should be on, on an exceptional season, maybe coming through second, you win it. Now, to me, what I remember about it is that those were the days when in Britain it caused hysteria that Manchester United were taken apart in Gothenburg, really, genuinely. Didn't seem to be as quick on or off the ball, didn't seem to have the same mental sharpness. Is how it looked. I was watching it on television. I'm not a United fan. But that result, still more... In Britain, nobody noticed that PSV got beaten twice by Gothenburg the year before. But that was up close to Styria. What, what do you remember of the group, the process, and the United experience? First of all, it's a different time, isn't it? It's before the Bosman ruling. Uh, you have to remember that uh, all the teams we played could only have three foreigners playing at the time. Not like now we can have more or less, uh, you can pick the best players in the world and you can play them all. That wasn't allowed at the time. And for Swedish club, we had we saw like one or two players every year from the Swedish league abroad, mainly to England uh, at that in England or Italy. Uh, if we're talking early nineties, uh, so we had a strong competitive side. We had a good experience from uh, the year before we, when we came second in the group. We lost out to Milan twice, uh, beat the other teams. And we thought, we thought even when we saw the draw, it was a tough draw, but we thought we were in with a fighting chance. We're in with a fighting chance. We play, we know we're going to be more of a team than the other, the other guys we play. We know we're physically good. We played in a different manner that most teams did at that time. We pressed, we pressed high. We stood with a, defense on the halfway line and try to put uh, the other team under pressure and uh, even though we lost the first game in Manchester 4-2 we thought we had, we had a half decent performance and after that we we didn't lose a game in the Champions League won the group uh, and got beaten on away goals against uh, Bayern in the quarterfinals uh, but I think I think we could have gone even further, to be honest, even further. And let's remember at that time we had seven or eight of the squad that played in in the World Cup 94 as well in Gothenburg. And now if you look at Swedish league, maybe you have one player from the whole league who who plays for Sweden. So it's different times. If I'm going to blame anybody for you not going further and not winning the Champions League that, that year, I'm going to blame, obviously, and you'll feel the same, Magnus Erlingmark. Because Magnus was a goal machine, if people don't remember him. You know, he was the one... You've just gone a little bit there. Magnus was a goal machine. Um, what is he? he? He gets two against Galatasaray, um, home and away. I think he gets against Barca. You beat Barca because, you know, with your humility, you went past the fact that you just brushed it off with we never got beaten again in the group. You beat Barcelona and drew in the camp now. Um, you, you wriggled your way out of talking about pumping Manchester United, which you did. Um, a game which got Blomkist a Champions League winner's medal eventually because that sealed his move. He, he, he plays in midfield because uh, Scholes and Keane are, are, are banned against Bayern in 99. But this goal machine, Magnus Erlingmark, erupts and it's only when you beat Bayern that he stops bloody scoring. It, it, give, give us the early mark question mark, please. To tell us. Great player. Great, great player. Uh, handyman. Uh, backup centre half to start with. Backup central midfielder. Ended up playing number nine for us in the Champions League. And I can't even remember why. But as you said, 
scored a few uh, really important goals, won six or seven titles in Sweden. He's probably played every position uh, in Gothenburg. Uh, I'm sure he even played goalie for, for 45 minutes or whatever. Really good team player and uh, I think we were maybe as surprised as the rest of Europe when he scored his goals. Um, Jockey, I'm not letting you off the hook. When you beat United, what was the key? What did it feel like? Because you can look at the group and say we're going to be okay here and we maybe we should have done better at Old Trafford. But that was a day when you just you you were a, as far ahead of them as the scoreline suggests, maybe further. And you must have been aware of the shockwaves that it caused. You must have been. Of course we were. Of course we were. I mean, we know we knew we were playing a good team. Uh, but we had a feel of them at Old Trafford. We talked about it uh, uh, before that game, what we could have done better. We knew they were a little bit vulnerable. And then we had, uh, you talked about Blomqvist uh, before. We had, that's probably his breakout game. Uh, we made his whole career. Uh, and we knew they were vulnerable at, uh, at the back. Um, pretty slow, good team, slow at the back. We... We used it well, and I think, as you said, we we won deservedly. Pauline got sent off, as usual, towards the end of the game, yeah. which helped as well. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like a game in, in, in Sweden, because I think Paul was sent off for that 98 Glenn Hoddle team. I think he got sent off when um, you win 2-1, I think Turn scores that day too, immediately after the 98 World Cup. I don't know what it was with Swedish territory and Paul, or maybe it was just a general thing. He loved a red card. Yeah, probably a general thing. I played. I played with Paul in uh, in Wolverhampton, uh, and I think he got yeah. sent off when I played him uh, in Italy as well, with Vicenza against Inter. Yeah. Default setting, I'd say, but really good football as well. Yes. Paulins, yeah. that's another one. That's another one who I think people nowadays get a little bit of a misconception about. Uh, hard case for sure. Tackler, ball winner, all of that, but a really good footballer as well. And let's not forget that. But he helped us out a couple of times as well. And that's appreciated. <laughs> you, you could, I think it's not stupid to make comparisons with what Keane did. Because Keane at his best would win the ball and drive and use the ball and score goals arriving on the edge. You might say as a pro, this guy was better or that guy was better. But they did similar things. And there was a level when Ince was at his top level when he was playing at a level that wasn't dissimilar to the impact that, that Keane had. Very similar. Similar footballers. I think uh, I only place, uh, played against Roy, never with him, but I think uh, Paul might even be the better footballer. Then it's all about winning and all of that, and I'm sure Roy has won a lot more than, than Paul, and in that sense is maybe the better footballer, but uh, Paul... Passing, shooting, all of that, uh, 10 out of 10. I, I'm going to draw you down an, un, an unwelcome path again because I'm, I'm going to talk about how amazing it was when you reached Barcelona. You stopped me, and if you want to talk about the Super Cup, where you no sooner arrive, arrive at Valencia and you're, you're beating Barcelona. But when you win the Cup, I don't know if you look back. I look back at my career and I realise how mental it's been. I mean, literally mental. Little elements of Gaza here and there, um, lots of luck. But this, you know, in 1998-99, you're at Valencia, um, you've been there a little while, but in the round of 16, when Valencia come into the cup, you're drawn in a, a local derby against Levante. You win that 3 0. In the quarterfinals, you're, you're drawn against Barcelona. You go to the camp now, where you've previously drawn for Gutterberg, so you walk in smoking a cigar, going, lads, this is easy, don't worry. Or maybe or maybe double snooze, I, I don't know. You win 3-2. You take them down to Mestalla, you win 4-3. Then you beat some team in the semi-final. I don't know if you can supply their name. I mean, you walk it, it's a 6-0. Is it an amateur? No, it's Real Madrid. And then you go to the cup final down in the Olympic Stadium, the Olympic Stadium, in a country that's never hosted the Olympics, in Sevilla, you score um, seven goals against Barcelona to knock them out, six against Real Madrid, and then you pump Atletico 3-0. Pick a moment, pick a goal, pick an opponent. Tell me about that cup run. I'd pick, uh, obviously, the semi-final. 
with everything I've been through as a footballer, that's that might be the most special moment. Because uh, as you said, we beat Barcelona in the quarterfinals home and away in two games with a lot of goals and then we got drawn against uh, Real Madrid. Uh, supposedly the toughest draw you can get in the semi-final first games at Mestalla and we beat them 6-0. We 4-0 up uh, at half time and uh, and that was a good Real Madrid. They, they won the Champions League the year after. It's not one of those uh, unforgettable uh, forgettable, uh, Real Madrid teams. It's, it's a good team with Morientes, Raul, Hierro, Redondo, what have you. Uh, and everything... It's one of those games where everything actually clicks into place from, from the get-go. Uh, the atmosphere at Mestalla was pretty decent as well because they hadn't won a title in 20 odd years, I think. Uh, craving for a bit of success. We knew we had something going, but to beat Real Madrid 6-0 in the semi-final, that's, uh, I think that's special. And I think it's... Very few people who can actually say that they've done it. And I'm one of them, so I'm so, proud of that. You, I'm going to name you in the side because you, you're behind you, you're Canizares. Next to you, you have a strange guy in Alan Roche. Um, it's Jockey Bjorkland, Carboni and Anglam are the two full backs. Mendieta, who tells me and has been on this uh, as a, he consistently says, I wasn't a very good footballer, I just worked very hard and I could run. Not true when we come to the final and you look at the goal he scores. Farinos, who's underestimated but a worker. Angolo, Luis Milla, who'd been at Barcelona and at Real Madrid. Uh, Claudio Lopez, who was exceptional. Goran Flyovic, who, who famously, if I'm not wrong, had encephalitis and had a brain operation to, to save his career. Juan Fran Popescu, and coached by Claudio Ranieri. So, I mean, just confirm what I'm talking about. People won't remember that. You're building up to a final that's going to be against Atleti and everybody knows Claudio's going to Atleti. Strange, strange atmosphere. Yeah, but, but that final, after passing the quarterfinals and the finals, I think uh, you have to remember that's not the Atletico Madrid of today we played. That was a team struggling a little bit in the league. Three years on from winning the double jockey, you're talking about Molina, Jelly. Chamot, Serena, uh, Valeron, Juninho Palista, um, Aguilera, Babel, the Czech, Jordi Larden, Jose Marie, there's some Santi Solari, um, coached by Antic. No, no, I'm not saying it was a bad team. I'm not saying that, but obviously going into the final after beating Barcelona and Real Madrid, we were the favourites, uh, odds on favourites for sure. Uh, and that's... Uh, it's good to win a final, that's what it's all about. So in that sense, it's the most important game. But I got big experiences of beating uh, Real Madrid in semis and, uh, and Barcelona in the quarters, I must say, personally. What was the thing between that Valencia and Barcelona? Because you just relentlessly thrashed them. Louis van Gaal had Valencia as his most hated opponent of all time. Because you, you hit them for fours and fives and sixes and Valencia consistently, I mean the Super Cup was just another thrashing. Barcelona, what was it that that Barcelona side couldn't cope with as far as your team? Tactics, I'd say. I'd say uh, Fajal, obviously, great manager, he's won a lot, but uh, when they played against us, a little bit arrogant. Because they knew how we were going to play and still they tried to play the same. We, we parked the bus. We parked the bus and counted every time we played against Barcelona. And we had probably the quickest, I'd say striker now, because I was the quickest player in the league up front. Uh, Claudio Lopez, the quickest striker in the league, playing against uh, Frank de Boer and uh, Abelardo on the halfway line. And that's, for me, is, uh, that's, uh, then, then you're begging for it, I think. Uh, but he didn't want to change because it's Barcelona. I'm Fanchal. We're not going to adapt to whoever we play. We're going to play the same. And it just suited us perfectly. Scored three, as you said, scored three, four goals against them every time we played them. And they kept on playing the same. 
and they had a decent side in that quarterfinal. I think they had uh, Rivaldo, Kleibert, and Figo up front, uh, top three. They're, they're a good team, but uh, I think we beat them on uh, tactics. We're the more skillful manager. You know, we're going to wrap up with three things, uh, Jockey. Not that I want to, but you have to have your life back. If you have regrets, not about season two when you go to the Champions League, your club goes to the Champions League final. And I'm not certain if you were fully fit in the remainder of the second season. But in the first season, you play a great deal in a Champions League side where, you know, going through to that final, I think that you can be regarded maybe as favourite favourites against Real Madrid because during the season you've been better than them they've been very poor they've changed coach they've clung on Vicente de Bossi has gone three at the back it's, it's worked but they've had a dreadful domestic season dreadful and then you know in the final you've gone through beating Rangers um, a couple of games against PSV Eindhoven again you deal with Bayern Munich two 1-1 one, one draws so you make it as far as the Lazio game and then from that reason, I guess it must be one of the regrets that for whatever, I don't know what Cooper's decision is, you're pretty much a, a change player or a, a, a bench player. I don't know why that happened, but from your perspective or the club's perspective, what are the great regrets about a season where after beating Leeds you end up in Paris against Real Madrid? And, then, and frankly, I'm not saying this because you weren't in the team and I can be honest, I was there, Valencia didn't turn up, didn't turn up in the final. Well, over over that season, when you're as close as you're probably going to be to a Champions League medal, what are the things you'd pick out and, and regret or change if you could? No, first of all, I play myself, uh, just for reason of playing in the final. I'm just joking. Uh, I think the problem is, as you said, we thought we went into the finals as favourites against Real Madrid. They struggled. Uh, they struggled in the league. We went in as favourites. They struggled in the league. We had a run. I think we won like the last eight games in the league. We hammered uh, Lazio 5-2 at home in the quarterfinals. We hammered Barcelona 4-1 at home as well in the semis. And we came in on a high against a struggling Real Madrid team. Not uh, thinking about experience in in big cup finals, to be honest. And uh, uh, if you sum up those 90 minutes in Paris, it's only one team on the pitch, and that's uh, Real Madrid, unfortunately. Beat us fair and square. They were hungrier than us. Sounds very stupid when you play Real Madrid in, in a European Cup final, but they were, because they knew they had underperformed the whole, the whole year. We, on the other hand... Uh, we're a little bit arrogant, I think. I think we thought we were going to win this game all by ourselves because uh, we had great form and all of that. I, I think uh, we had different attitudes towards the game. We came in as favourites, even in our own eyes, and I think that's a big mistake every time you play Real Madrid in a big European Cup final. Uh, you're never the favourite. Yep, sorry for the salt in the wound of having to go over that. And, and, and uh, any defeat is worse if you think that n not just yourself, but your teammates haven't really competed at the maximum. That's always the sorest. It's always the sorest. Again, our sponsors are with us all the time. Thank you, Beth365. Um, you're now working as assistant manager at Hammerby. You, 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 you cavalierly um, left us behind at La Liga Television. We've never been the same since. And, and sadly, that's a fact. You are now working as assistant manager at Hammerby, which gives you an even better standpoint to tell us which of all your managers either um, inspired you the most or helped you the most, or you now look back and think, although you take something from everybody, I take most from that guy. I've been lucky to have quite a few managers I really enjoyed respect and very very knowledgeable i think uh, one who stands out is the one who brought us to success in in valencia you spoke about him claudio uh, ranieri who i think uh, in england had a little bit of an unfair reputation until he won the league with leicester i'm very happy for him very good tactician 
defensive minded coach but then again excuse him he's Italian so what do you expect but then again Walter Walter you know Walter Smith uh, Rangers uh, first and foremost fantastic man fantastic person interested in you as a human being as a person not only your football skills uh, hopefully uh, you have to ask my players uh, but I try to have the same approach as Walter towards my players uh, not being one of of the guys but try to be interested and positive that, that, that's uh, that's one uh, of the guys I appreciate the most uh, Mick McCarthy thoroughly good man as well uh, he's had a long career in football old school in one sense but uh, still young enough to be interested in developing the play develop, developing your players still young enough to be interested in your players uh, so I, I, I've been lucky I've had a few really good ones I must say Prandelli I had in Italy went on to have a great success with the Italian national team got sacked after seven games in Venezia without I'm um, asking you to, to be anything stupid and dictate to Henrik. Henrik's back in this city now. And, um, you know, as a player, I, I don't know any player who was there as brief a time and began to have to impact as a substitute who was then literally adored. But you're used to seeing Henke adored for Sweden, for the clubs that he scored for and coached at Manchester United too, but at Barcelona, at Celtic, it's, if you could encapsulate the same love that Celtic fans have for Henrik and say that over a smaller time, it felt the same at Barcelona, his impact was literally extraordinary. Now he's back having to help Ron Koeman coach Ansu Fati, who is very new, but his talent is phenomenal. It needs to be guided and moulded. He's back having to help Ronald Koeman deal with Leo Messi. What do you think um, Henrik brings to this situation at Football Club Barcelona? Because he had a relatively hard time as a coach back in Sweden, not reflecting on him necessarily, but it didn't go the way he wanted. Yeah, I think that's more due to the circumstances in the clubs he, he managed in, in Sweden than... Uh, his own knowledge of football, I think. Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, I'm very happy and proud because I'm a Swede after all. And he's a friend of mine. Uh, that we that we have a guy who's actually part of the managing team in in Barcelona and working. I, I'm, I still have, haven't fully understood what his exact role is in Barcelona. What's it going to be? But uh, I know Ronald. Uh, Kuman uh, trusts him and to work with young guys, uh, especially strikers. I think I think he'll be the perfect uh, match. Uh, he's been there, he's done it as a player. Uh, oh no, I'm I'm really happy for him. A little bit jealous as well. Would I be right in saying that because Henrik, I mean, his passion, his explosiveness was all in his private life or in training. He's a very he can put on a very cold, clinical head. And he also has a very reserved, careful manner uh, because he assesses and thinks. But bringing, not just Barcelona, bringing a man like that with his experience, but also his pretty cold, balanced, clinical head into quite an explosive situation, that should be a help to the people around him that he isn't going to get swayed by all the nonsense that goes on around him, I think. That's uh, probably why they hired him. I think they need a, a cool guy in Barcelona. I mean, we all know what's uh, what happened last year. Uh, results haven't been there. Uh, it's been a turbulent season. And uh, I think he might be one of the guys to calm it down a little bit and get it moving forward again. Because uh, I think not only Barcelona needs it, I think... Uh, Spanish football, to be honest, need, needs it as well. Uh, need a club like Barcelona to to perform better than they, than they did last uh, season. That's a good point. The last one is, you're, you're outside club time at the moment, so the deal that you made with your boy means that you're his dad now. So when I ask you to describe Carla a little bit, honestly, what kind of footballer he is, what kind of aspirations 
you have for him, how he's doing generally now, generally, broadly for Hammerby. Take some dad pride and tell us a little bit about one of your boys who's got the, the highest profile now and he's got your sense of humour because I seem to remember he scored a goal a couple of weeks ago and made some comment about your goal scoring record. So, like father, like son. I always had the opinion that records are there to be broken, right? Even the, even the ones who seem unbeatable. <laughs> one goal. <laughs> no, he's, he, he's doing well. He's doing really well. He's had a tough couple of years. Uh, he did his ACL, had an operation. Yeah. And then when he had uh, his operation, he had a fracture in his kneecap. Uh, He's been training really hard, really, really hard, uh, and this year he's got the opportunity to, to play, and uh, he's performed well. Big, strong guy. He's uh, bigger than me, probably stronger than me as well. Good going into duels. Uh, if you compare him to his dad, you could see that he is raised in Spanish football with the ball. Yeah, let's put it that way. Yeah. Then the image I want to leave our, our listeners with is. Um of the bemused Spanish residents in your Valencia um, apartment complex when they heard shouts of, What's that? as you tuned in to the cricket. Sign off by telling people what the hell it is that you love so much about cricket. I, I got stuck. Uh, I watched it first time in we went with Sweden to Australia uh, on a, like a pre-season tour. 92, early 92 in January. Watched a bit of cricket with Patrick at the hotel room. We didn't understand a thing about it, but we, we, we thought it uh, looks good. Big crowd was uh, MCG. Uh, it might even have been Boxing Day. Uh, ashes. Yeah, yeah. D-test. And then I moved to Scotland. Uh, and then you can see it on Sky. And I think what... What got me hitched is not the game per se, but it's the commentating. I think uh, Sky's done really well. They've brought a lot of uh, old players, really good players, funny, witty. And, and that's, why, that's why I started to like it. And now it's me and my younger son, William, who's uh, keeping a flare up here in the, in. The, in Sweden, it's not much cricket around here. I can give you all-time cricket eleven as well as you, if you want. This is Jockey's eleven, and I'm only talking about players I've seen playing. Want three fast bowlers, right? I'll have Glenn McGraw, easy enough. Kirtley, Ambrose, a bit of flair, and Wasim. Then we need an all-rounder, and now I take Jock Callis. Out of the ones I've seen, batting and bowling, uh, probably the best. And I haven't seen Beefy played. So if you've got any English watchers, we will make an excuse for that, right? Jack Callis uh, as the all-rounder. No, we need a spinner. Uh, it has to be Shane Warne. Another Australian, wicketkeeper, I'd say Adam Gilchrist. He, he can open uh, batting as well. Five batsmen to pick, and Sachin needs to be there, for sure. I think we need to have Ricky Ponting. We have to pick one English player as well. Alistair Cook, uh, no thrills, but uh, really good batsman, right? Leaves us with two more, and now it's getting difficult, right? Brian Lara, one left. Must be another West Indian. I'd say Chris Gale. Not on Mary. I, li- I just like to watch him. Uh, like to uh, yeah. see him bat. Yeah. Listen, man. Um, that was an, a massive pleasure. Um, I both hope that you are back here soon, and for your sake, that you're never back here. Um, that you're either managing Sweden to a World Cup win, or perhaps president of the first ever one day World Cup winning Sweden cricket side. One or the other. And if neither of those happens, come back here and enjoy yourselves with us because we still have a good time over here. I will sooner or later. That's a promise. Mr. Joachim Bjorklund, Swedish football legend, um, international set symbol, well-known drinker. Thank you very much.